Welcome to Aloha United We Stand, Aloha United Way's weekly spotlight on the people and the organizations making a difference here in Hawaii. Uh, and I'm Chris Aguinaldo. I'm your host here at Think Tech Hawaii, raising awareness for the issues uh, that are important here in Hawaii. Joining us today to talk about uh, foster children, foster youth transitioning into uh, society and adult life, I have from uh, Imua Kako uh, and the Independent Living Program at Halekipa, Michelle Kinimaka, and she's also brought a guest, Des, and they're going to join us for the next 30 minutes. And again, remember, you can join the conversation too about foster care and transitioning into adult life at Think Tech HI on Twitter. So, Welcome, Michelle. How are you, you today? Good. Thank and you. welcome, Dennis. Good morning. Mm -hmm. Michelle, can you give us a, a little bit of a background of uh, what the program is? And you mentioned these are a couple of programs. The uh, to me earlier, the Independent Living Program and Imua Kako. Could you give us a background on what you folks do? Sure. Independent Living Program is a federally mandated program. Every state is required mm -hmm. to provide independent living services to their youth in the foster care system. And for the state of Hawaii, that includes after they've aged out, we continue to provide support as well. One of those supports is the Imuokako program. That is the state of Hawaii's new initiative to provide voluntary extended foster care. So a youth who ages out of the foster care system can choose to remain in up until their 21st birthday under voluntary status. And then they could continue to receive benefits and to support themselves while they're actually able to live out in the community. They don't have to remain in a foster home anymore. And you mentioned this is a new program. How long has that particular uh, program been in place? A little over two years. We started July 1st, uh, 19, or 2014. Uh, what are the main uh, parts of that program? Why, why was it started and what is it uh, addressing for the foster youth? Well, generally, when the when the youth turn 18, a mm -hmm. lot of times the supports they've been receiving from mm -hmm. the state for so many years disappear. And so the concern is a lot of those youth would end up homeless. Many are incarcerated. Um, they have trouble maintaining jobs, employment, and housing, um, or going to school without support. So this provides um, continued support for them. They need to be participating in one of five um, categories to be able to qualify, mm -hmm. whether they're working towards still getting their high school diploma if they are in a college or a vocational program, if they're working 20 hours or more a week, if they are in an employment readiness program or a program designed to break down barriers to employment, or if they are medically disabled. Those, they would have to be participating in one of those two. To to so did they find that those were particular areas that uh, a foster child transitioning into adulthood uh, lacked? Uh, was it problematic? Was it something that uh, when they looked at how they were transitioning into uh, their careers or older lives beyond high school. That was something that needed to be addressed. Generally, it was. It's really more of a catch-all of areas mm -hmm. that they can be, areas they may be working towards. So, it's not an, unlike any youth in the in the general population where they might go on to college or still be choosing to go into the workforce. But what it does is it provides them those benefits. They continue to get the foster board payment that would go to a mm -hmm. foster parent, comes to them to help pay, support themselves. So it really gives them a little extra, um, a little extra support to be able to do those things and not have to worry as much about having money to pay their rent or survive. Because most, most children at 18, when they, when they turn 18, they may stay living with their parents, which most of our youth don't have that opportunity. They're kind of out on their own in their community a lot of times. So this really what that is, is it's just allow them to do the same things that most other people might be doing, but have a little support while they're doing it. Now, uh, do you have any sort of figures to how many children are in foster care here in Hawaii right now? Um, I don't know the exact okay. numbers because we're, we don't have everybody on the caseload. Of course, there's mm -hmm. uh, much younger children that we don't service. But there is um, a significant it's population. It's in the thousands. It's somewhere, mm -hmm. I think, between two to 3,000. It might be a little lower than two. It, cha it changes from time to time. And But there is like a significant population that needs this sort of... There help. is. On the island of Oahu, there's around 80 youth a year that would age out of the foster care system. And by aging out, Meaning, again, they're, they're, is it legally turning 18? Turning 18. Um, for some of them, mm -hmm. they may stay in a little longer if they haven't finished high school yet. So it may be 18 and a half or sometimes 19 um, if the state decides they want to continue their case longer. But for the most part, it generally means eight, turning 18 when you're in foster care and losing those benefits. Now, Des, were you facing something like that before uh, being part of the program? Yes, I've been in foster care for like... Mm, three years now with the family mm -hmm. that I was with, but um, 
before that too, a long time. Um, regarding like home situation, mm -hmm. yeah. It rent, school, I was going to school full time, um, working full time. So I had to pay rent even though that was my situation. <laughs> so how did you hear about them? How did you hear about this program? Through my social worker. Mm -hmm. I, um, I don't know her name, <laughs> but it was through my social worker at the time. So she like got me connected and that's how. So Michelle, when someone like Des comes in or uh, you are connected via like a social worker or a caring mm -hmm. social worker, what happens? How, how do you uh, pull them in and, and what steps do you take to get them into this transitioning program? Well, a youth can be referred to the independent living program mm -hmm. as young as 12 years old. So we could be working with them for several years before they age 12. out of care, as young as 12. The majority are coming in somewhere around 15 or 16, some right before they age out though. So they are referred by their child welfare social worker and then they would be assigned a, a individual case manager who works with them where they're at, what, what it is that they need and they're usually meeting with them out in the community, helping them apply for college and scholarships and all that kind of stuff and really preparing for that emancipation period. And then once they age out, they would be eligible to move into the Moacock Co program and they'd still get that, they'd move that same case manager, would move with them into that program and continue working with them and, and addressing those issues and, and things they need support with. Housing is really the biggest, the biggest issue for them. So some are fortunate to be able to stay in their same foster home. Some mm -hmm. foster parents will allow them to stay um, and some, you know, are moving out with, you know, friends or other family members, so. Is that what you found? I know you mentioned earlier rent, uh, mm -hmm. was that, is that a really big challenge just to be able to uh, you know, have a place? Yes, well, the, when I aged out of mm -hmm. the system, um, it was 18, so on my birthday I happened to move into like an emergency foster home. Um, I was just placed there temporary, and I wasn't supposed to stay there as long as I have, which is three years now. So they become like my family, they love me as like their own daughter, um, but besides that, I started working and so mm -hmm. they required me to pay rent. It's not that much, like it's four, so I pay 460, so 460 for my phone. Mm -hmm. That, that's, you know, not expensive at all compared to where I would have to pay elsewhere. So that I don't mind, but rent, going to school. So I had two jobs, two part-time jobs at the time. Um, that was hard, but now I have a better job. Oh, so good, it's okay, good. I can afford to kind of not so much live paycheck to paycheck because it's a better paying job. What from the program has been the most helpful for you, Des? What has been, how, how have the people and how, have, how has the program helped you along? And not just uh, RedWise, but uh, looking, looking for your, toward your future, looking, looking at uh, things like uh, jobs and maybe uh, places to live on your own. I would say hands down mm -hmm. case manager. Oh yeah. Um, my case manager meant a lot and she still means a lot. She's so helpful, so kind. And she has been with me for four years. So she knows me, she knows like how I work and she knows how to influence me and she's always been there for me until now. So, but the case managers, they're a part of your life. They're a big part, mm -hmm. yeah. And what, what do you think, uh, of all your experiences there, it, it's your case manager uh, that really helped you out. Uh, mm -hmm. any, in, any, of the, any other parts of the program or any uh, resources that they gave you? Oh, yes. So they have the higher ed. Mm -hmm. um, that was what she was saying. The money that they give the parents initially, it goes back to you. So I don't know if I'm allowed to say this lump, the money. Okay. Oh, okay. It's, it was um, 576. 529. 529. Now it's six. 76. Okay, so that helps a lot with, um, so that was my money for rent, so I didn't have to pay for my paycheck. Um, the financial resources, the scholarships that they have, they have um, geared towards foster youth and you can use that. Um, I did Kamehameha scholarships. Mm -hmm. um, I never had to use the ETV because I didn't need it. Oh, what, what is that? Uh, something. The ETV stands for Educational Training Voucher. Okay. That's actually some federal money that's given to the state mm -hmm. to give out, almost like a scholarship, but it's needs-based. So once they've provided all their financial information, how much expenses they have for school and housing, and, and then how much they have coming in in scholarships, and 
the, the aid money that comes from their, uh, their board payment. Then if there is a deficit, mm -hmm. they can apply for this money to up to $5,000 a year to for assist with the rest purposes, of those yes. scholarships. So really, uh, participants have that resource to, to uh, is it get higher education, vocational education? Mm -hmm. Correct. Uh, how do they respond to that? Uh, um, the, they're always happy to get whatever kind of resources they can get. And we do a lot of work helping them find all the different scholarships and the things that they're eligible for. And a lot of things they wouldn't, you know, may have not known about even. So um, she mentioned the higher education mm -hmm. board payments. So the uh, Imul Kako only goes till their 21st birthday. Um, in addition to that, they have five years of something called the higher education board allowance. And that is basically the same thing, the stipend that comes from the state, that uh, the foster board stipend that they can get if they're in a higher education program or a vocational training program. So at that point, that drops off the benefit for the youth that are just in the workforce mm -hmm. or in employment readiness classes. They do have to be in a, in, a, in a higher learning or a vocational program for that. But that's five years. So they could essentially get three years of benefits at Imoa Kako and then five more available to help support themselves. So a total of eight years, possibly, if they were doing college. So really getting a really good start yes. to either a career or um, or a uh, college matriculation program, Correct. Uh, if they desire, but but it has to be, uh, you know, the, the desire has to be there. Yes, uh, I understand that. Uh, like you mentioned, having that that uh, counselor with you, your case worker with you, pushing you along, that's a really important part of of the transition process. Correct. Yes. Yeah. Um, through school, like I've mm -hmm. always been good with school, but. She was there emotionally <laughs> a lot and just guiding. She gave me advice through like life, a lot of life lessons actually. And she was there with me through the different jobs I went through, the different homes. Um, yeah, an overall support system in one person. <laughs> And, and mm -hmm. some stability and some familiar faces along the way. Oh, yeah. She was with me for four years. Right. Yeah. And one of the other parts of their job is the skill mm -hmm. building. So on top of just helping them make sure that they're stable in their housing and school is skill building. We help them learn the things that they'll need, money management, um, sexual health, general health. There's a lot of, you know, how to cook if they need to learn how to cook, um, nutrition and learning how to do their grocery shopping. All the things that you might teach your own children mm -hmm. or, um, and with foster children, they may be in one home and get a lot of good, stable education. Um, some of them bounce around from home to home for years and they don't have the opportunity for somebody really to invest in, in making sure they know how to write a check or address an envelope or fill out a job application. So mm -hmm. these are all the things that we help them Is do. Is that more challenging when you're dealing with the transitioning youth who, who have been in more than one uh, foster home? Definitely. And a lot of times it really has to do with the trauma that they come in with that um, you know most people end up in the foster care system because of some kind of a trauma history. So for the most part, and then being in foster care itself can be a little traumatizing. You know, like you mentioned, moving home to home is not an easy thing for any child. Going to live with a perfect stranger, you can mm -hmm. imagine, nobody would want to have to do that. Let's so. talk a little bit more. We're going to take a little break, but right now we are talking about youth transitioning uh, from foster care, and we're taking a short break so you can learn more about the programs and people at Think Tech High. <laughs> It's me, Angus McTech, wishing you to welcome and join us to see us on Hibachi Talk on Think Tech Hawaii. Join my co-hosts, Gordo the Tech Czar and Andrew the Security Guy every Friday from 1300 to 1345. We look forward to seeing you. We'll talk tech and we'll have some wee bit of fun. And remember, let your wing gang free wherever you be. Aloha! Hi, I'm Donna Blanchard. I'm the host of Center Stage, which is on Wednesdays at 2 o'clock here on Think Tech. On Center Stage, I talk with artists about not only what they do and how they do it, but the meat of the conversation for me is why they do it, why we go through this. A lot of us are not making our livings doing this, and a lot of us would do this with our last dying breath if we had that choice. And that's what I love to talk to people about. I hope you enjoy watching it, and I hope you get inspired because there's an artist inside you too. Join us on Center Stage at 2 o'clock on Wednesdays. Bye. Welcome back to Aloha United We Stand. I'm your host, Chris Aguinaldo, and we are talking with uh, Michelle Kinamaka, 
who is the program coordinator for the Independent Living Program and Imua Kako at Halekipa. And we're also talking to Des, who participated in the transition program. We're talking about foster youth who are transitioning to adulthood and the challenges they face and the resources that are available to help them become members of society, uh, workers, college students. And we're picking up the conversation uh, with Michelle. Thank you. Now, uh, before the break, uh, we're talking about, uh, chal again, challenges to uh, foster children sometimes mm -hmm. when they are in multiple homes. Is that a common situation here in Hawaii? Very common. Why would that happen? Um, some of it's just that a lot of times the youth is really mm -hmm. not in a place to be stable because of the situations that have gone on in their life. And frequently they'll run away um, or not be a good fit for a home. And a lot of times it's really not about the home or the foster parents, but about the, the youth really, you know, the stuff that's going on inside of them that they're just really not able to, to remain stable. And the challenge too is to just find that environment where the child, the youth, uh, can nurture, thrive, or just feel safe. Yes, and, and I'll tell you, there's always a shortage of really good foster homes in, in Hawaii, I'm sure, all over the country that, you know, we can always use more people that are willing to open their homes that, you know, they have a lot of love to offer and support for, for children. Now, what kind of person uh, is the ideal uh, foster par parents, plural, uh, for or that, that uh, would be appropriate or would be needed? And when you say there's a shortage, what kind of people uh, are needed? Well, I know that they need people who are willing to take teenagers. Mm -hmm. A lot of people want to foster the cute little babies. Um, it's harder to get people who want to deal with some of the issues that come along with parenting a teen. So you were so. a teenager, Deb, when <laughs> yes. you entered this? So yeah. it's far more difficult? Yes. yes. That's what I heard, too. Oh, but they, you they turned come out to with... be lucky, right? <laughs> I've been blessed with the Mamana support and like the people that have been placed in my life. Mm -hmm. I feel like being a foster child I have been blessed in that area like and I realize that now like there's so many people and children who have had like not I guess the support that they mm -hmm. need and that's a big deal so like Michelle said those who are willing to welcome mm -hmm. a teenager yeah. into their lives you need somebody who really cares for starters that they're not going to make money off of it that's you know it's it's meant the money that they're given is meant to support the child so it's somebody with a big mm -hmm. heart and a lot of patience. So like any monetary amounts that we've mentioned, it's all in to support the children who are participating. Correct. So they have to go in thinking more of more of a family rather than... Correct, than, uh, because you want to help. Because you want to help. And it sounds like you, you got the people that, that you need at Des. Mm-hmm, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, what else would the ideal foster parents be like? Um, you know, I don't know if you can even say that there is an ideal because it, it can be, be anybody. They anybody who's willing and willing to, you know, to support and help a child and be, a, you know, be a parent. And they don't even have to have parenting experience. We have people over the years that have fostered that have never had kids of their own. Um, some of the greatest homes are the ones who maybe can't have kids of their own and, and open up their home to foster kids. And you mentioned earlier uh, things like uh, cooking, writing a check, really basically learning to be in a home. Mm -hmm. All these these home skills, just having a, a life mm -hmm. and picking that up from from someone who is living a life. Right. And you folks help supplement that by by making the connections and giving resources. Yes, right? that is correct. Uh, we had mentioned uh, a little bit earlier about uh, opportunities such as funding education. How about uh, helping them find housing or a home? Housing is a big part of what we do. Mm -hmm. Hands down, as for youth who've aged out, housing is the most crucial issue. If you don't have stable housing, you're not going to make it to that job or make it to school every day or be able to get your homework done at night if you're trying to figure out where you're going to sleep. Um, and we do have youth who end up homeless. It is a big issue. Um, but we have a lot of a lot of resources to help them within Halekipa and some of the stuff that we're mm -hmm. doing in the community. We have. Um, everything from a supervised home, where, like a group home style, where they can live with a resident advisor living there at night mm -hmm. um, that can house up to four young women that have aged out of care. We have um, a couple of apartments that we're just now bringing online that will be where they can live without that supervision, just four roommates at a really affordable rate. That's the key thing is the affordable part for are them. These are your own um, apartments? These are, it's two properties that Holly mm -hmm. Kipa owns that we've used for other things in the past and they're not being used for anything right now. So one is an apartment that will house um, four girls, basically renting a room and the cost they'll pay will be just to cover the cost of maintaining the, the keeping the house open basically. Um, in that group home that I mentioned, they, they only pay a percentage of their income 
that goes towards a mandatory savings. They pay no rent in that program. And that's really hands on. There's a case manager and a resident advisor that are in there teaching them skills in the home. Um, and they're required to be working or going to school. Uh, we also have a set of apartments downtown that's a collaboration with a, a, one of the buildings downtown that has affordable rates that we lease three units from that building that we turn around mm -hmm. and sublet to our youth. And so they pay the full rent. It's an affordable rent of 665 for a one bedroom, which sounds to the general population like really affordable for most of our youth if their only income might be that 676 then mm -hmm. and maybe a little bit of scholarship money, then that's going to be you know a little harder to manage. Um, we also have a program with, it's a HUD-based program with um, Section 8. This is Housing 8. and Urban Development, right? Correct. Housing and Urban Development. It's with the City and County Section 8 office. Most people who know about Section 8 know that Section 8 waitlist was closed for about 10 years. They have recently opened it up a couple of times to kind of do a lottery to get back on their wait list. Um, but there's a program called the Family Unification Program. This is a nationwide program, but only in select communities. Mm -hmm. So um, Honolulu or Oahu is one of those communities. And so youth who've aged out of the foster care system can have immediate access to Section 8. All they do is they come to us, we fill out the application, we turn it in, and they go through the process getting approved, basically, mm -hmm. and get their voucher and go find a place to live. So, um, and they can do that up until they recently expanded that. They to have until they're uh, 24 to apply for that program even so and it's time limited it's not like mm -hmm. lifetime section 8 but it is um, for up to three years they can get that benefit a section 8 voucher to, to live in the community on their own and basically paying rent that's based on 30 percent of their income mm -hmm. so the section 8 that like you mentioned it is living on their own in the community correct uh, but previously you were speaking about uh, there would be roommates living together. Mm -hmm. They contribute a portion to the rent. What sort of responsibilities or what, what, what are the things that they must do or practice while they are living together? in those apartments? Well, we would require them, of course, to have some kind of income, so a mm -hmm. job or, or something that has income. Um, they're expected to be either in an employment or a, a school program of some kind or training okay. program. And um, But within the house, it's really going to be just like any roommates. If you got a bunch of friends mm -hmm. together and we're going to rent a house or something, you know, to go to Manoa or wherever, that um, they'll be living with each other. They'll just have a little extra support from us. They will still have case management services mm -hmm. that come along. They all will be either in our program or one of a couple of other Holly Keepa programs. Um, and we'll still be in there kind of playing, you know, a little oversight, a little, kind of like a landlord that's a little more in their business than a normal landlord might be. Okay, so making sure that they are they actually have food around, paying Yeah, paying they'll provide bill. all their own food. Really, they just got to pay their rent to us. We're paying the utilities and providing internet, and, you know, everything else is kind of on their own. So um, the cleaning, you know, the, they'll have to set up some kind of a cleaning schedule and, and uh, there, there won't be a curfew. Some of our other programs that, where they're mm -hmm. living with the staff uh, supervised, there is curfew. So that's one of the things they don't tend to like when, as they get older, they don't, you know, they'd rather have their freedom. So okay, but fr freedom comes with paying your rent on time, right, right. cooking, so. having having a job. Mm -hmm. Uh, going to school. Mm -hmm. And that'll be available to some youth who've already been with us and demonstrated some responsibility. So generally we won't be looking at youth who are right aging out at 18 moving straight into that apartment. Mm -hmm. We'll be looking for some of the youth who've shown a little bit more responsibility and the ability to live somewhere and per, you know show some independence and responsibility. Mm -hmm. But in this case, does you're still are you still with your foster parents? Or are um, you No. So I had I had to move out. Okay. It's a long story. <laughs> okay. Yeah. But were they helpful during that transition process for you? My foster parents? Or? Both of them. Oh, yes. Yeah. Um, like I, I lived with them for three years. Mm -hmm. But um, I guess I don't live on my own right now. I live with a friend slash auntie. So, I mean, I don't know. Mm -hmm. But they were helpful, mm -hmm. yeah. But still the same sort of thing, making sure that bills are paid on time, making sure that everybody has, uh, you know, contributes, has food. It's still, it's still uh, learning and still transitioning into independent living, right? Yes, mm -hmm. very much. Now, how, how would we get more information, and how can people in the community help, Michelle? Now, any foster youth who wants information about things that are available to them in foster care can go to a website called shakatown.com, mm -hmm. just like a, sh you know, spelled like shaka with the word town on the end, all one word. And that's actually a state-run website, but they can sign up for an account there as a, as a current foster youth or mm -hmm. a former foster youth. And, and there's information mm -hmm. on there about events and things like that. 
Um, it also has contact. You can find my information on there. If you find a contact us for Oahu, you would find ours. So. And if we go to the uh, Halakiba website, can we find more information there? Yes, too? there is a section. Look for the programs, and you would be able to find independent living there. What's that website so. for um, our Halekipa viewers? Halakiba.org. So H A L E. H A L E K I P A dot O R G. And you they can find, find more that there. Correct. On, on everything that we've talked about. Correct. And youth can refer themselves. If they're over 18 already, mm -hmm. then we don't need consent from any guardian. So they can, at that point, if they need assistance and they're not in our program, they can refer themselves. And how about regular community members? What, what would, uh, how, how can they help? Any volunteers or any um, sort of uh, events of, coming up? Of course, money is always good. They can make mm -hmm. donations directly to Holly Kipa um, or through United Way. But um, there's also, we have sometimes community donations of things that they could use when they're moving out to their first apartment. Um, we are always looking for landlords who are willing to rent to our youth, especially for our Section 8 programs. If you're a landlord that's willing to take a chance on a young kid that might otherwise maybe not even have the best credit built up or anything, that um, that's always helpful as well. Anything else that you'd like to share with our viewers today? Any, any last thoughts? I think we've kind of said a lot, so... Um, Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I've been speaking for the last uh, 30 minutes with Michelle Kinamaka, the program coordinator for the Independent Living Program and Imua Kako at Halekipa. And Des, thank you so much for sharing your story, too. We really appreciate that. And again, if you want to learn more, please check out the website. And I'll put that on my Twitter. And I'll also quote uh, Think Tech Hawaii's Twitter. We'll put this information up. And for all of you who are watching, thank you very much for watching Aloha United We Stand. Take care of yourselves and tune in to Think Tech Hawaii.